Shalom family, welcome to Verses of Jesus. Um, I'm going to be continuing the part two to the Verses of Jesus project testimonies. Um, this project is following the lives of the Verses of Jesus alumni who have gone through the One About Deliverance program. And in this first segment, we are documenting the testimony of one of our, one of our very anointed sisters, um, Sister Deborah, she, as she shares her journey of deliverance and sanctification. Verses of Jesus' um, mentorship and deliverance program was one of the tools the Lord made available to her during her season of seeking deliverance. And um, she went through the program for eight weeks. And obviously, we understand that deliverance is a process. So we are documenting her journey pre and post deliverance and just really seeing um the impact that the program was able to create in her life and also what she took away from the program understanding that deliverance is a process sanctification is a lifestyle and is a lifetime um so i'm not gonna waste most of our time we're gonna go straight into the video but before we do that i want us to read from first thessalonians 5:23. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it reads, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit, your whole soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What many don't understand is that deliverance is a tripartite process. Deliverance goes on in the spirit, it goes on in the soul, and it goes on in the body. So you can gain a lot of deliverance in your soul but what about your body what about your spirit and i think many believers they don't want they want a magical process they want a magic wand you know you you, you wave your magic wand and you're delivered it, it, mostly it's not it doesn't work like that many get discouraged many want a fast process that's why many people end up seeking help from the devil because they think what the enemy has to offer them is just a sharp process not knowing that they go into deeper bondage. So why am I sharing this? I'm sharing this because sanctification, this, this, this verse tells us that God sanctifies us wholly. So deliverance is a process of where you become whole, right? And it's not just in your soul. It's not just about breaking soul ties and breaking covenant and breaking curses. It's also in your spirit and it's also in your body because curses and um, evil covenants and demonic, um, Affliction can also manifest in the physical body. So deliverance is a process where God is able to really work on your body, on your soul, and on your spirit. It's a tripartite process and it's not something that you just wake up and you just, it's not a button that you, you, you achieve. God actually wants you to work out your deliverance stage by stage so that as you, the more you get delivered, the more you're able to reclaim the ground that you've lost to the enemy. And it will sustain and maintain your deliverance. So in the uh, mentorship, which is now the academy, we don't just give you a fast track or like a do this, do this. No, we, are, we, and, uh, we really empower you and we enable you to understand the deliverance and especially sanctification because the demon can leave. Yes. But what about the damage the demon have done to the soul? What about the stronghold the demon has built in the mind? What about the damage the demon has done to the physical body? Okay, healing may come to the body. But what about the other damages the demon has done? So that's why deliverance is a process. Sanctification is a process. So you will be watching Sister Deborah's testimony. She's actually doing a five-part documentary with us. So this is the second clip. So I'm super excited for you to see this. And I want you to stay at the end of the video because I have more announcements on and updates about the academy um, because I know many of you are inspired and you would like to find that more details of when we'll be having our next deliverance academy so stay behind at the end of the video and I will be sharing those information God bless you hi everyone today I'm doing a video on how I took the tools from the vessels of Jesus mentorship and utilized and integrated them into my personal and spiritual life post-deliverance. 
I believe all of these tools um, are of very high importance and I haven't put them in any specific order. But one major thing that I took from the mentorship is spiritual discipline. During the mentorship, we did a lot of fasting, uh, prayer meetings, things like that. We had a, a schedule that we were all held accountable for and I loved that. But I realized after the mentorship, I no longer really had that accountability where I had to stick to something. So I just realized very quickly um, the negligence towards my prayer life and life of fasting, it um, just, it didn't take long for the old me to try to come back up. It didn't take long for old thoughts and old sin and old habits uh, to try to arise. So I realized very quickly that the spiritual discipline and just having a schedule that holds you accountable is very important. And I didn't do this from a mindset of, oh, I'm scared of the enemy and if I don't do this, they're going to prevail over me. But more of a mindset of, I love God and I want to be used by Him. I want my cup filled so that I can fill others. I want to please God. I want to fulfill my destiny. I want that relationship with my Father. I want to hear clearly from Him. Things like that because, honestly, me laying down and not hearing, me laying down each night and not hearing from God is scarier to me than any nightmare could ever be. Um, I just realized when I'm in constant prayer with God and worship towards God, and let's remember worship, you're not only joining the angels in heaven singing to God, you're not only edifying the Father, but you're also reminding yourself, you are also speaking to your spirit man and reminding your inner being how good of how good God is and what all he's done for you and just his his love and his compassion towards us so spiritual discipline is huge um I've realized that you'll never just have time to do these things you have to make time it is a a choice the Holy Spirit will will urge you to pray the Holy Spirit will urge you to read your Bible but you can always reject what the Holy Spirit is telling you you can always say well I'm too tired well, I have too much going on. You know, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He'll never force you to do something. But um, he will urge you and it's up to us to have that that fruit of the Spirit of self-control to say, you know what, instead of filling my mind with social media, I'm going to go and pray. Or I'm going to watch this sermon instead of watching mindless entertainment. I'm going to read the Word instead of reading this new novel that was released. Or, you know, I'm going to spend time with the Holy Spirit instead of just scrolling on my phone for an hour. You know, choose to do things that edify God and that fill your spirit with just the the truth of God and that increase your faith instead of polluting your soul. Um, because everything you do, it edifies something. So you may think, well, this isn't really doing anything. It's not good or bad. Well, then just get rid of it. If you fill your soul with things that only edify God and that speak truth, you'll notice your faith will begin to increase and it'll be a lot easier for you also to preach the gospel to others um, when when your, your faith is high. And definitely don't have a religious mindset towards it of, I have to do this, but make it, but let it be something that you want to do because God knows the intentions of your hearts. He knows if you're worshiping him just because you don't want to have a bad dream or if you're worshiping him because you truly believe the words that you're singing. And here's the thing, if you are having an off day in, in your thoughts or anything, worship God through it anyways, because the more that you sing worship songs to God, you will begin to believe what you are singing. You know, the same way you have demonic programming through demonic music, you can have holy programming through singing songs of praise. So, you know, it's your choice and that's where the spiritual discipline comes in. <clears throat> Are you going to make the choice to do what's right, to do what you know what's right? Or are you going to make the choice to uh, pollute your soul and to come out of alignment with the Word of God and the will of God for your life? You know, that's it's completely up to you. So many of us blame God for the issues in our life, and really a lot of it's on, on us. And it has more to do with our self-control than, um, than, than with God. Everything is easy for God. Nothing is hard for God to do. So it's not hard for God to deliver you. A lot of the times God is waiting to see a change in you. Um, the curse causeless shall not come. So if there's a curse, there's a cause. So sometimes we need to ask God, okay, what is the cause behind this curse? What is the open door? What, 
you know, because a lot of times, like I said, it, it, it's not that you better pray hard enough to get a reaction out of God. Sometimes God's saying, I'm right here and I'm ready to deliver you, but I want to see this change in you. Because if you're delivered and go back to the same things, the Bible says the spiritual attacks will be even worse than before. The demons will come back worse than before. All right, I went off on a tangent there. Sorry. Another thing um, that I realized through the mentorship was so important was uh, just the baptism of the Holy Spirit and being a vessel which doesn't just have access to the Holy Spirit, but being a vessel and like living a life where the Holy Spirit wants to come and stay not just, you know, getting deep and intense into prayer and accessing the Holy Spirit for that moment or for that hour or for that night or for that midnight prayer, but living a life where the Holy Spirit is not pushed away, living a life where the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you. <clears throat> I remember during the mentorship, I went and uh, met with my pastor and I was prayed over. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues and Remember that night before I went to sleep, I said, God, did, did this really just happen? Was I really praying in, in tongues? Like, was it in my mind? What was going on? And immediately I fell asleep and had a dream that um, I was in the same church. I was being prayed over. But instead of it being my uh, pastors and the church congregation praying over me, it was angels, big angels and suits and ties, you know, just uh, leaning me over and just telling me to receive the fire of the the holy ghost and i did and i prayed in tongues in the dream the same way i did in real life um and i just noticed that when i received the baptism of the holy spirit and began praying in, in tongues that a lot of my dreams began to shift for the better <clears throat> i'll give this um so the bible says that the Holy Spirit helps our infirmities and the Holy Spirit intercedes for us and the Holy Spirit prays for the things that we know not what to pray for and everything is according to the will of God. So we can never forget that when we're praying in tongues, it's literally the Holy Spirit making intercession for us, crying out to God for us on things that we don't even know that we should pray for. I remember when I began speaking in tongues, one night, um, I was given instruction to just start speaking in tongues for 15 minutes a night just to grow my grow my spirit man. And the first night that I did that, for did it for 15 minutes, you know, I, I asked God before I fell asleep, you know, is, is this doing anything? I, I don't feel any different. I don't see anything happening. Like, is this doing anything? Well, I fell asleep and in the dream... I immediately had a dream and I knew that I needed to find my my daughter. I was looking for her life jacket. I knew I needed to find it. I was searching everywhere. I was by the ocean. And I remember that I found her life jacket and I pulled her life jacket out of the water and she was still in her life jacket, but she was face down in the water. I pulled her out of the water and put her on the dock and she had drowned. She was dead. She had been dead for a long time. And this is spiritually. She had been dead for a long time. Um... I started to give her CPR and I was praying over her and I gave her CPR. My husband was with me and she, all of the water that she had drowned on came out of her and um, she, she got up and she was able to talk and everyone knew that God had just brought her back to life. And I remember just hearing like clapping and crowds and praises all around me, just so happy for what God had done. And I woke up and I could still physically hear just the clapping and the cheers because through the obedience of me saying, okay, God, I know that the Holy Spirit is very important. I know that praying in the Spirit is important and you have instructed us to do so in your, in your word. So just that obedience, God literally brought my daughter back to life from a spiritual death. I mean, so we can just never undermine the power of the Holy Ghost and the power in, of praying in tongues. So another tool that um, I'm now utilizing from the mentorship is I realize the power of prayer or of, of worship. Of course, prayer has power too, but I realize the power of worship. Um, I would always sing Christian songs like in my car when I was younger and things like that, but I had never really like worshiped God, like really known who God was. But in the mentorship, I began to see a lot more of the, the hand of God. And I remember one night when I was fasting, I actually went in my closet and I bowed down before God. And I never bowed down to worship again, but I was like, you know, this God, he, he deserves reverence, you know, 
he deserves for me to be on my face and on my knees just worshiping him. So I worshiped him and I remember wondering if my worship was even reaching him because I couldn't even, I was crying so hard I couldn't get the words out. This time I was, this night was different though. This night I wasn't worshiping him because I was scared of the dreams I was having and I wanted him to deliver me. This time I was worshiping because I loved him and because I missed him. I wanted to see him. I wanted more of him. And all I wanted was to be with him for the rest of my life. And I remember thinking that I was crying too hard. I was like, God's not even going to hear this praise. It's not even going up to him because I'm crying too hard. And that's such a human way of thinking, you know, but I fell asleep uh, immediately afterwards because this was later at night. And I had a dream. I was playing with a walkie-talkie, which is a two-way communication device. One was in my hand and one was in the sky. I turned the walkie-talkie on. I didn't even know what I was doing. I was just playing with it because this is the same thing with worship. I didn't even know really what I was doing, but I knew that I wanted to worship the King of Kings. And I uh, set off an alarm. I turned the walkie-talkie on and it set off this huge alarm in heaven. And God said, my daughter, what do you need? I'm dispatching angels now. So... <laughs> Yeah, God is so good. And here I was thinking like, well, I'm crying. I'm not getting the words out. So God's not hearing me, you know. So we have to remember we worship not only because we're joining angels worshiping God, not only because we're edifying God, but also when we worship, we are reminding ourselves. We are ministering, ministering to our inner man, reminding ourselves of the goodness of God and his faithfulness and his love towards us, which is, and we need those things to keep our faith increased because your walk with Christ is not just a one-time thing like I said this prayer or one time I had faith or one time I read my word or this one time I worshiped. It, it's an everyday thing. Like just like you, you need to eat, just like you need to shower, things like that. It's something that you continue to do all the time. Um, it's not just a one-time thing. You cannot neglect worship. You cannot neglect prayer. You cannot neglect the word because you will find your faith dwindling. Remember, we're saved by grace through faith. So without your faith, there's no salvation. Another um, huge saying that I learned during the mentorship was the importance of submission to authority. I battled really bad with submission to authority because just the authority figures that were placed over me in my life, especially as a child and as a teenager, um, they did a horrible job and they caused me to look at every everyone in authority over me. I would just automatically think that they were out to hurt me, out to get me, that they were liars, that they were just horrible people. And that was all just a lie from the enemy and something that had to be reversed. But God really began to show me the importance of submitting to my husband submitting to my pastor, submitting to the, the mentorship. I realized that not submitting to spiritual authority actually opened me up to uh, more spiritual attacks. Like I would have dreams that I was taking my head covering off and then I would get attacked in the dream. But your head covering represents your spiritual coverings like your spouse and your pastor, things like that. Um, so the book of Ephesians talks about submitting to one another in the fear of God and about how wives are to submit to their husbands as they submit to the Lord. So ladies, if you're listening to me, yes, the Bible literally says submit to your husband as you submit to God. So it's not that you make your husband God, but you submit to him the same way that you would submit to God. You treat him the same way that you would treat God. If you say you wouldn't back talk God and you know, you wouldn't lie to God and you would take direction from God, then pay that same respect to your, your husband. Also, um, submission to the Holy Spirit is huge. James uh, 4, verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves to God and the devil will flee from you. Submission to the Holy Spirit is so big, and I will say that a lot of your deliverance depends upon your obedience to the Holy Spirit. If we always obeyed that still small voice, our deliverances would probably take half as long. <laughs> um, I remember when I first started my walk with Christ, I just thought that he was coming down on me hard for a lot of things. And I remember I just hit the ground one day crying and I said, God, I, I can't do this. I'll never be good enough for you. Like, I can't do everything that you're asking me to do. I was very upset and I said, I just feel like I'll never get it right. You know, I feel like, like it was just a, a lot everything I had learned in my life was completely like turned upside down 
for the better. But um, yeah, I remember just thinking that it was really hard. And I remember just feeling like I couldn't please God because I was just so sinful. And I had a dream that night and God is so faithful um, because he knows in our hearts the things that we're dealing with and he's faithful to answer us by his mercy. I had a dream that night that I was in a classroom and the teacher walked in tall, dark and handsome. It was Jesus, it was the, the Holy Spirit, whatever you wanna call him. And he came in and he put his foot in my neck and that's what it felt like he did in real life. I felt like he was putting his foot in my neck and it kind of hurt. And I remember I left the classroom, I was upset, I left the classroom and I went to get into my car. He followed me out there and he asked to get in the car with me. And he said he wanted to show me the, the, the town. So the classroom I was in, it was a very nice classroom, uh, very upscale, protected on, on all sides. But I remember when I went out to my car, it, we were in a very dangerous place. And I remember wondering where I was. He said he wanted to, to just show me the neighborhood. And he asked if I had permission to leave. I said, no, I didn't ask to leave. And he began to tell me that um, his authority is not from here, his authority is from heaven. And that he is here to teach his children and to correct them because he wants what's best for them. And that sometimes he has to be hard on them because if not, they'll take advantage of him. And he showed me the neighborhood. It was a very dangerous place. I remember there were people getting shot, people getting um, murdered, robbed, people screaming everywhere, cussing, like very dangerous things. And he said, you know, this is a dangerous place that you're in and you can come back in the classroom with me. As long as you're in the classroom with me, you, you are safe. As long as you are learning, you are safe. Follow me. He said, you have a choice. He said, now if you wanna leave, you can leave and you can come out here, but it's not safe for you out here. And I remember I, we, we drove back to the school after we talked for a little while and he was just so sweet and so kind, such a gentleman. And we went back into the school and uh, he was happy that I came back and he told me he loved me and he hugged me and he began to give me an assignment. And he also told me how important timing is. So yeah, God is good. Like I said, just never neglect that still small voice because it's usually God, especially if it's telling you something positive and to do something that you know is right and that is holy and edifying towards God. <laughs> like I said, it'll speed your deliverance up, up a lot. Uh, Hebrews 13, 17 uh, talks about submitting to spiritual leaders that they will actually give account for you. Um, and this is something else I learned in the mentorship. Praying for your leaders is very important um, because, you know, they're, they're going through a lot. Um, they are people too, and nobody is too high up to fall, you know, so it's always good just to pray for God's mercy upon their life and just for their protection as leaders. Repentance is a huge thing that I took with me from the mentorship. Wash your hands daily. Don't be too proud at the end of the day. You know, um, don't say, well, I repented. I've been repenting for the same thing all week, so I'm just not going to repent tonight. I'm too tired. No, never be too proud to tell God you're sorry. Even if you're repenting for the same thing every day, just... Keep, keep repenting for it. Keep asking God to help you. Go through your day. Walk through your day. See where you got it right. See where you missed it. Thank God for the blood of Jesus that has already covered where you've missed it. And repent, be sorry, and then move on and know that God has forgiven you. And that's a huge part of it is believe that God has forgiven you. So many times we go to God and we feel so guilty for our sin we just feel like we've gone too far this time or that we've made the same mistake too many times and that he's just done with us and that that's not the truth at all. God is actually saying, bring me your burdens, bring me your sin, put it all on me, I will bear them for you. He already did, he bared it all at the cross. So another thing is forgiveness. I've learned that forgiveness is an all the time thing. It's not just something we can say, well, I forgave somebody, I already forgave them like last year I did forgiveness prayers once for them. Forgiveness is an all the time thing because I've noticed that sometimes over time, um, you know, if you notice thoughts or scenarios hard to keep popping up in your head about someone like negative ones, you probably need to go and work on forgiveness towards them, especially if it's um, someone who you've had a traumatic experience with or someone who has rejected you or just done something really terrible to you. Usually the forgiveness isn't just a one and done prayer. It's something that you have to 
kind of go go back to sometimes and just ask God to continue to help you to forgive that um, this person. And whoever just came to your mind when I was saying that, the person that you said, well, I've forgiven them. That's probably the person you need to go back and forgive because I know that when people talk about forgiveness, sometimes I have someone come to mind and I'm like, you know, that's probably someone I, it's not going to hurt just to, to go back and work on, you know, having compassion on them and forgiving them and asking for God's light to shine upon their darkness. Mark eleven twenty five talks about, you know, um, when you pray, make sure that you're forgiving others so that God can forgive you. And that's the flow I was talking about in the last video, a flow of forgiveness from God to you. Don't block that flow because if we stop forgiving people, God can stop forgiving us. Don't be the wicked servant who wanted mercy, mercy, mercy. But when it came time for him to give an ounce of mercy, he, he couldn't give it. You know, don't be a hypocrite. Another um, huge tool I took from the mentorship is application of the Word of God. Not just reading the Word of God, but reflecting on it and applying it to your life. I've gone through times where I've read the Word of God and I'm like, I'm not seeing any changes. What's going on? And God will show me that. I've taken my spiritual glasses off that I'm reading with no glasses and uh, which is really if you're reading if you're reading the word of God but you're not reflecting on it if you're not digesting it and allowing the Holy Spirit to help you to apply those things to your life then it's really for nothing also um, an important thing to do is to place your name in scripture when you're reading the word of God Place your name there because this is God's love letter to you. It is individually to each and every one of us. So place your name in scripture and act as if, read it as if God is speaking directly to you um, in every verse. Mindset and perspective um, is huge in your walk with Christ, in your, your everyday walk with the Lord. Um, rejection and trauma can cause like a dark filter on the way that you see life, the way you see people, the way you see God, the way that you see yourself, you know, um, okay, I'll just say really quick. So I used to have like a really negative attitude. I used to see everything just as negative. You could do everything in the world, to make me happy and I wouldn't be happy. And God showed me you know, all of these sunglasses ranging from black to yellow and a bunch of pretty colors in between. He pulled out the black ones. He said, these black lenses, this is what you're seeing life through. And he pulled out the yellow ones. He said, these yellow ones are what you need to be seeing life through. You need to be seeing life through the lens of the Holy Spirit. The, just like I say, have the mind of Christ. And um, yeah, he just showed me you know, you see everything through death, everything through negativity, everything through rejection, you know, everything through sorrow and hurt. But you need to be seeing everything through love. See everything through, you know, just my my word. Honestly, use the word of God as a lens to see life through, to see people through, to see yourself through, to see God through. I'll be honest, at one point, even during the mentorship, I got extremely religious and I was really judgmental. And I remember just looking at like women um, who were dressed inappropriately or wore a ton of makeup, you know, and I'm just being like, oh, they must be a Marine agent. Like, yeah, they're working for the Marine Kingdom, all these things. And then God just, um, he arrested me about that, you know, like, how can we love God when we don't even love those created in his image? And um, you have to think like whenever Saul, take Saul, for example, in the Bible, when the first disciples saw Saul, they probably thought he was a lost cause, right? They probably thought there was no hope for him that, you know, and they didn't even know that God was going to turn around and use him for his glory and look what Paul ended up doing for the kingdom of God. So it's like the same person that you're judging today could be the same person God resurrects tomorrow. And we have to remember that. So now instead of looking at people like, Oh, I bet they have a spirit of gluttony or that pastor hasn't fasted a day in his life. 
rude things like that, like the thoughts that I used to have towards people when I see them now, my mindset has changed. My perspective of people has changed. My perception of people has changed even. So now whenever I see someone, um, I try to have more of a heart for them and to think, this person, you know, is displaying this on the outside because of what's on the inside. So now I see this person has been rejected. Somebody has severely probably hurt this person. This person's been traumatized. This person's been desensitized to sin. You know, I try to um, just really have a heart for them and to think this person needs Jesus just like we all do. This person needs to know Christ. They need to know that they were fearfully and wonderfully made. They need to know that there is a creator who created them specifically for a purpose because and because he loves them and he died for them because he wants to spend eternity with them. You know, now I try to see how can I help this person instead of just judging them on their makeup or their hair or their clothes, you know, yes, I know what a lot of those things probably mean or re like represent in the bondage spiritually that's come with that but now I try to think okay how can I is there a way that I can help this person is there something I can say to this person to quicken their spirit to want to dive into the word of God and to know Jesus Christ you know so yeah I'll just end it with it's all about love and trust with God um the ten commandments uh, it can be summed up in Two statements, love God, love people. Um, and I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you for staying behind. Um, um, we've come to the end of this particular video and I just wanted to share with you the um, information for our next upcoming academy, um, Deliverance Academy. Um, so we have our deliverance program yearly. Initially it used to be the mentorship, but now it's turned into an academy. Um, which typically runs between 10 to 11 weeks or sometimes 12 weeks um, The last one we did was for 11 weeks. So applications open up um, From December through to January. So about two months you have two months to sort of apply and then um, We begin the process is quite a long process. That, that's why I'm trying to break it down because um, It's not that you apply today and you interview tomorrow and you start to, you start next, next week it's kind of it takes us almost six months to get the applications out screen um do the screening the interviews select the candidate um have orientation with the candidate and then begin the program so it's 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 quite a lot so you you, you would have to be engaged um because it's something that is online um so it's a correspondence type base of um, communication so you really you need to understand what is going on so applications open in December up to January and then from about March or thereabout we begin interviews or maybe later in February all the way down to spring and I mean spring I mean April and then um, um, we begin the process in summer um, the we begin the academy in summer so this will be well 2023 will be cohort two so probably sometime from June July um, that will run all the way down to autumn for like 10 to 11 12 weeks and um, yeah so that's the process if you're interested there'll be more information coming so don't worry if you don't know all the details but if you want to apply keep an eye out once the forms are ready will let you know or update you you you'll be able to just it's a good document that you just fill out it's a bit extensive so you will need to um set time aside and really think about the questions so that um, the, the more we know the more we're able to help you kind of um guide you through your deliverance thank you for watching and see you in the next clip shalom